from state services. I commend this bill to the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mr. Speaker. I call the Honourable Member Chris Hipkins. Mr. Speaker, about the only thing that, that, that was notable about that yeah. member's speech is that at least it was on the right bill for a change. But everything else about that, that was possibly the most boring ministerial statement that we've heard in this House for quite some time, uh, coming from the architect of the Mount Albert disaster for the National Party. Uh, Mr Speaker, there is much in this bill that the Labour Party supports. Uh, we do support moves to join up the public sector more, uh, to streamline public services more, to make the public sector more efficient. There are a lot of elements in this bill that we would be very happy to work with the government on. However, there are also elements in this bill that mean it is not possible for us to support it at first reading. And I'm going to run through those in a moment. But I'm also going to make an offer to the government. If they genuinely believe that, in, that improving public services requires some co cooperation across the parliament, and I believe that it does, then we're willing to work with them. But they're going to have to give up some of the things that they're trying to put forward in this bill in order to get that cross-party support. And there are three main areas of concern. And I want to talk about, first of all, about the ability for chief executives to delegate their powers outside of the public service. So what we have in the mo at the moment is a chief executive can delegate the powers that they are given by law, they can delegate to someone else within the public service. And this parliament can hold those people to account for that. Because ultimately every public servant, one way or the other, through, it, through the, the public service chain of command, is accountable to the Parliament. What this bill will do is it will allow the Chief Executive to delegate statutory powers that they hold outside of the public service to an agency or to, or to an entity, a private entity, that is not accountable to the Parliament. And that is something that we in the Labour Party will simply not support. Uh, we have already seen this happen in a particular piece of legislation that related to private prisons, where uh, statutory functions held by uh, corrections staff can now be delegated to the private sector, and we did not support that then. And we, won't, we will not support the blanket uh, application of that particular principle to the wider public service. The second thing uh, that we're concerned about is the potential reduction in the scrutiny of the public service that is affected, uh, that, that is, comes into effect through this bill, through the, effect, through the amalgamation of the estimates and financial review scrutiny processes. I should point out at this point that is quite a significant change to the way this Parliament operates. And yet it has not been consulted, the Standing Orders Committee has not been consulted about that. At the moment in this Parliament, we have two major financial processes that we, engaged, uh, that we engage with through select committees. We have the estimates, where we look at the forward-looking budgets of the government, and we hold ministers to account for the decisions they have made about how taxpayer money should be generated and how it should be spent. And there's a clear accountability there for, of ministers to their parliamentary colleagues through select committee and through that to the public for the decisions they make about where, where money should be appropriated and where it should be spent. The second process that we have is one that's retrospective, and it is holding the public service to account for how that money has been spent and the decisions that they have, that they have taken in how it is applied and in how government policy is delivered upon. And the key accountability there is of the chief executive. The chief executive is responsible for their agency or their department delivering on what the government have provided them funding to do. So there are two clear accountability processes here, and we, and we, and we as a parliament deal with them separately through the estimates process and through the financial review process. This bill combines those two processes together. Now that is a significant change to the way the parliament operates, and yet the parliament, the, the, the organisations in the parliament that would normally deal with these sorts of changes, the Standing Orders Committee and so on, have not been consulted about that. They haven't been consulted. That, this has not gone to the Standing Orders Committee. And yet it is a significant change to the way the Parliament will function, and it effectively halves parliamentary scrutiny of the public service. So let's, I mean, let's be really clear about this. This bill halves parliamentary scrutiny of the appropriation of public funds and the expenditure of public funds. And that is something that we in the Labour Party simply will not support, and we will certainly not support it if the government haven't taken 
the, the steps to consult with other parties in Parliament to make sure that such a significant change is broadly supported. In, the, in New Zealand, we don't have a written constitution. We don't have a law that, that, or, or, or a, you know, a written document that allows other laws to be struck down as unconstitutional. This Parliament ultimately has the, ulti you know, the ultimate power. What we say goes. The laws we pass apply. What that means is when the rules of this place are changed, they should only be changed with broad bipartisan or, or multi-partisan agreement. That has not been secured for this. This is a huge change to the way the parliament operates, and the national government expect to pass this through, I think, probably with a one or a two vote majority, in, or probably only a one vote or maybe a three vote majority, depending on what the Māori Party do in this House. That's simply not good enough. It's halving parliamentary scrutiny of taxpayer financing. That is not good enough, and it is not OK for the government to pass that with a bare majority. It is simply unacceptable. And I'll extend to the government again the offer that we are willing to work with them on the elements of this bill that we think are positive, because there are many elements in the bill that we think are positive, but we will not allow them and we will not support them unilaterally overriding the rules of this parliament and reducing the public scrutiny of their activities in the way they intend to do. The final thing that I want to talk about, or the final area where the Labour Party has major concerns with this bill, are around the changes that relate to collective bargaining by those working in the public service. What this bill allows the government to do is issue by order in council directives around how collective bargaining, around the outcomes of collective bargaining before the bargaining has even started. So the government can effectively say by law what the outcome of collective bargaining is going to be before anyone has sat down at a table to even put a claim on the table. Now that just cuts, cuts against all of the principles that underpin good faith employment relationships. It means that the government decide, before bargaining has even started, what the outcome of it is going to be. And we will not support that either. That's, something that, that's the sort of policy that Rob Muldoon would have implemented. It would have given him the power, and he did have policies and legislation like this, that gave him the power to decree what settlements were going to be without any reference to any kind of bargaining process. That's effectively what this bill will do. Under, under the current provisions in it. And there is simply no way that we in the Labour Party will support that. There are provisions in the bill, as I mentioned, that we will support. Um, we do support uh, moves to get government departments working more closely together, sharing services, and uh, making sure that the public sector offers, I guess, seamless career opportunities for those working within it. Uh, for younger people uh, who, who move into the public service, they want to know that they can move around quite seamlessly between different departments and agencies. It's not the old sort of days which we might be familiar with from TV shows like Gliding On We Went, so you got a job in a, a government department, you were there for life. Uh, younger people moving into the public service actually don't want that. But what they do want to know is that when they move around within the public service, uh, that their, I guess their, their tenure within the public service is going to be recognised. So, so elements of this bill there move more towards a seamless public service, uh, more towards career progression opportunities within the public service. Those are things that we will certainly support, uh, and we're, in fact, we're, you know, we'll actually go out there with the government and, and champion them, uh, setting uh, clearer, I guess, improving accountabilities of the public service, improving accountabilities for crown entities. These are elements of this bill that we will support, but we will not support. Uh, the provisions in this bill that allow the government effectively to contract out their statutory responsibilities. We will not support uh, the provisions in this bill that allow the government to decree by law the outcomes of a collective bargaining process before it has even started. And we will certainly not support the elements of this bill that will halve parliamentary and, and through that public scrutiny of decisions the government make around the appropriation of and expenditure of taxpayer money. That is simply not democratic. And it is, sets a very alarming precedent for this parliament that the operating process of this parliament can be changed by legislation rather than by a change to the standing orders which would be supported by all of the parliament. It's actually a very dangerous precedent 
for this government to establish and to seek to establish through this legislation. And I, I seriously ask them to reconsider that, that element of this bill. Because changes to the way Parliament operates and changes to the provisions in our standing orders should be made through the parliamentary process and through changes to the standing orders, not by legislation that is passed by a bare majority of the people in this Parliament. That, that is a change to our constitutional arrangements in New Zealand, and the way the government are going about doing it is simply wrong. I call the honourable member Todd McClay. Mr. Speaker, more effective, more.